Hello everybody, glad you could make it. My name is Kaylee Allen and welcome to a completely, completely, completely different video this week. Let me explain. I want to get right into it and tell you that if you are here for pure plant content, this is not the video for you. So today I will explain the reason why we're all here on a Tuesday. I know it's a little bit weird, but Recently, I have broached the subject of talking about a kind of like a mental health repot with me, with you guys. And we've gone back and forth over it for a little while. I would say, I think I mentioned this a long time ago on my channel, but very recently I got it organized and we are doing it today. And I opened a question box on my Instagram stories around about, I don't know, as of recording this video, maybe about five or six days ago, of things that you would like me to talk about. A lot of questions and topics were sent in and I've narrowed it down to five topics. I'm going to be very upfront with you and tell you what we are discussing in today's video because I understand the importance of trigger warnings or just situations where you might feel uncomfortable and you might not want to hear me talk about certain things. So as of right now, I am putting on the screen for you the things that will be talked about, what part of the video they will be in, because I believe I might have to split this video into two parts because I do tend to ramble, the timestamps that they are, and you know, if you want to skip to a certain part of the video, you can, because I don't want anyone to feel you know, like they're, they're in a situation they don't want to be in, essentially, with me talking about things. I will warn you prior to the time, if you are not looking for any timestamps, before I start to talk about something potentially triggering for somebody or anything like that, I will let you know. So please do not worry, I've got you. Nothing's going to jump out at you out the blue, because I understand it's very, very important. Some people are affected by things like that, some people aren't. So it's important to abide by that. Now that you know the topics, before we get to those, I want to tell you that I haven't bothered to report anything. This is for a few reasons, to be honest. I think editing a lot of what I say is probably not the best idea, I don't think. I also don't really think it's something that I can, you know, pot through. You know, I use lecker a lot. It's noisy. It's distracting. I don't particularly want any distractions. No one really cares if I'm cutting up the stem of a plant. It's just, it just didn't feel right to do it. So I am sat here very awkwardly, actually, in front of my living wall. And I do have some notes for today's video because I felt that the topics were quite meaty, I would say. So I do have some notes to talk about. So I'm going to go through them in order that I've shown them on the screen. If I've split this video into two parts, you will know via the screen I previously showed you. So this is either a part one of two or it's just the whole thing. So I'm going to tackle these subjects in order and I'm going to read them out loud. Let me find the list of subjects. This is very ad hoc, by the way. It's not overly edited. It's just me talking to you. So the format is very similar to a repot with me in terms of style. It's just, there is no actual repotting. I'm just kind of sat here. So the topics I'm going to talk about in order are number one, taking care of plants when you are depressed. Number two, social media and the impact on our self-confidence, whether that be looking a certain way or more specifically to people that watch my channel, you know, having certain plants, I guess, and your plant collection kind of thing. Number three is cyberbullying and haters and how to deal with it. Number four is self-harm, how to stop and my experience. And number five is arguably the fun bit, which I thought it'd be really good to end on that. And that is self-care. So how to de-stress things I find helpful. One more thing before we get into this. You guys ask me a lot of things, okay? I don't want to necessarily speak on things that I don't have experience on or I don't have something to offer you on. I don't think it's very fair because I don't want to speak out of term. I don't want to say things and people think you're so off. That's not useful to anybody. So I've, when I answer these questions, when I pick these questions, these questions were trending the most, but they're also the things that I can answer the most, if you know what I mean. There's, there's just some things that I, I don't have experience with. So it's not that I'm not comfortable talking about it. It's just that I can't offer you anything necessarily that useful, I guess, is where I'm kind of going with that. So, news presenter shuffle. The first question, the first topic I should say to talk about in this video is 
how to take care of plants when you are depressed. Depressed, anxious, feeling down, feeling low, low energy, anything you like. It doesn't have to be that you're depressed. It can be anything that fits into a similar feeling, I guess you could say. And I'm going to start this off <laughs> in true Kaylee Allen fashion, okay? Because I know people have a go at me for being negative, and I know that all of you guys know that watch me every week know that I'm not being negative. I'm just not sugarcoating. And there is something gaping for me personally in terms of plant care and having plants and mental health that people aren't really talking about. So obviously, we're going to very briefly talk about it. So for me, all I hear on the internet, in any media, TV, magazines, it doesn't really matter, to be honest with you. All I hear is about the houseplant boom and essentially how houseplants are now brilliant for your mental health and they're very good and you get the nurture from seeing things grow and it's all awesome. Yeah, it's cool. That is true. Okay, I'm not knocking that. But there's a lot that they don't tell you. Is there not? What about if you're already feeling down? You know, is a new houseplant really going to cheer you up? Maybe. Maybe not. And I don't know why people aren't talking about this, because honestly, for a lot of people, and I know this is true for, I don't know how many of you, of course, but I know this will be true for a lot of people, the thought of a new houseplant when you are feeling depressed is not a good thing. I'm sorry, but it's not. I don't understand why people aren't talking about this more. It's so important to acknowledge that things like this aren't always good, okay? So what I mean by that is, you can feel, I try and articulate this obviously throughout this video the best I can, so please bear with me. But my thoughts on it are, if you feel really shit and really down, if someone gets you a houseplant as a gift, that's not necessarily going to instill those feelings that the person gifting you the houseplant thinks it's going to make you feel. Because you're into plants, right? I know I'm like lumping other people into this, but if you think about it this way, you know, you're down, you're really down, you may be more down than what your friend, for example, thinks you are, and they buy you a houseplant, and they think it's going to pep you up. What people don't realize is, it may not. So for a lot of people, when they feel down and they feel depressed, they take a look at it. It doesn't have to be a new plant, by the way. I know I'm saying that. It doesn't have to be a new plant, but plants they have, and they sit there and they think, oh, great. Now I have another thing to watch die. Now I have another thing to fail at. Now I have more guilt of, you know, not being able to care for a living thing. Now I've lost more money. Now I'm going to disappoint someone else when my friend bought me this plant and now I can't take care of it and it's going to die. I, I, I'm not up to this. I'm not up to this right now. And I do not understand why there is nobody talking about that. And I want to tell you right now, that those feelings that you have, and yes, this is a prelude to talking about how to actually take care of them. Don't worry, we will get there. It's just really important to give this thing context. I want you to know that this is so normal to feel that way. It's so normal. It's so normal. I felt like that before. I haven't necessarily felt like it with plants, and that's only because I had, I already had some measures in place that would allow me to take care of them, which obviously I will share with you in my limited experience and limited knowledge. Um, but I want you to know that feeling like that is so normal. It's so normal. Please don't just sit there feeling like a failure, looking at all these articles about plants for your mental health and how they make you feel better and how you now feel like a fucking failure for not feeling that way, okay? It's normal to look at something like that and think, oh shit, that's not a good thing for me right now. And that's great that you can sit there and feel that and admit that to yourself because this is how we start to get better and this is how we start to learn to deal with any feelings that we have that are causing us any distress. Part of it is acceptance for me personally. Again, this video is on my experience and I should have said this at the beginning. I'll do it now. Um, this video is obviously based on my experience and things that work for me. I am not saying anything in this video is a one size fits all, okay? I'm just presenting my angle on things, which of course is probably different to a lot of other angles from a lot of other people. It might be the same angle as other people, who knows? But part of feeling better slowly but surely is just acknowledging the things that are making you feel worse. And that's okay for it to be plants if you love houseplants. 
That doesn't make you weird. It doesn't make you crazy because this thing that you love now turns into something that's causing you great distress. That's not you being weird. That's normal. It's because you give a shit. It's because you give a shit that you feel that way. It's because you're a good person that you feel that way. Okay? And by the same stretch, by the way, it's okay to not care. Because even in not caring about a plant that you have in the corner dying because you're not feeling your best, you're not capable for whatever reason it is. It doesn't have to be depression, of course. It can be because you're physically unable to care for those plants. It's okay to be like, okay, it's just a plant. They are living things, guys. I know this. But they are also plants. And you are more important. It's okay to care. It's okay to feel guilty that you're not caring for them. But it's also okay to go, okay, it's fine. It's going to die. I can't deal with this right now. I'm going to take care of myself. Okay? Both of those sides of the argument are totally valid. It is totally okay to feel negative aspects of owning plants when you're not feeling your best. And I do not understand why people don't talk about this. They need to. It's so important that we harness that certain things that make us feel great also make us feel like shit. Okay? That's a great thing to know and understand about yourself and understand about people around us. It's great. It's awesome. And we need more of that. Because obviously we love houseplants, but when you're feeling down, houseplants can be a massive sap on your energy, your mental energy, your happiness and everything else. Because if you're feeling really shit, and I, I mean, I, this is a stereotypical example, you know, you, you can't get out of bed or whatever, and your plants, they're not getting water, that maybe you got the curtains drawn or something like that, and you, you know, they're not getting light, they're not getting water, they're not getting anything, and they're, they're just slowly dying. That's, that's, that's going to make you feel worse. Of course it is. That's not you being weird. <laughs> You know, of course it's going to make you feel worse. And it's a drain on your mental health when that happens. It is unfortunately a further drain because you are watching something die. And it's horrible. It's really horrible. It's not nice. It's not going to make you feel better. And that's okay to know and understand that. And it's about when you tackle plant care, when you're upset, it's also really good to knowledge and harness the the situation you're in and the effects it's having, it's such a, a calming thing to understand why you are feeling a certain way and why certain things are happening. Part of, and I'm going to repeat this a lot in this video, but part of learning to take care of plants when you're depressed is about accepting the failure that may come or may not come. But it's about accepting that that might happen. So if I'm a depressed person or maybe I'm prone to bouts of depression in cycles, because depression can often come in cycles, it's certainly used to for me, um, you know, you can accept that if, if your depression cycle comes every six months, if it's not um, as a result of a life event, then it's so helpful to accept as part of your plant care that, you know, this could happen and you might lose plants. And that is okay. It's okay. Don't put that extra strain on yourself. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. And I understand that, you know, Taking care of plants or a lack thereof taking care of plants when you're depressed is a mental strain. Do you know why it's a mental strain? It's a mental strain because you give a shit. It's a mental strain because you, like everybody else, are actually trying their best. And it's really shit when you try your best and it's not good enough. Obviously, that, that's, that's a universal feeling, I feel like, that a lot of people can relate to. And if you are struggling to describe your feelings to someone else that you may need to help you in these situations, that's a really good way of looking at it. It's like your best just isn't good enough in this situation. And it's dealing with that feeling. Obviously, you have to deal with whatever outside things are, are also obviously affecting how you feel. You, you, if you're depressed or you're anxious or whatever. But it, it's so, so, so important to be able to analyze the situation you're in and accept that a lot of your feelings are okay. I know, obviously, your feelings are okay, but my point is a lot of people don't feel that way in the moment. You don't feel like how you feel is valid. And I'm here to tell you that it is. So, my tips. <laughs> my tips for taking care of a plant when you are, um, you could be depressed, you could be physically unable to, maybe you have, um, you've undergone surgery. Or, I, I mean, I don't want to get specific. For whatever reason, you cannot physically take care of your plants. Any reason under the sun, doesn't have to be depression. I have a couple of tips that I've wrote down. I actually do a lot of these, I don't do all of them, um, but it's things that I've found actually quite helpful to me and they may or may not be applicable to you, it really depends. So I have them written down. So if you see me looking down, this is why. 
But my first tip to look after plants, not only when you're feeling down or feeling depressed or you physically can't look after them, but a permanent tip is honestly self-watering. And I use this at home. I use it for a different reason. I'm going to be totally transparent with you. I use it because I'm not really there. I'm there one week out of two. So I'm there for a week solid and then I leave for a week. Then I'm there for a week solid and I leave for a week. So I use them for that and they are great. And I know that you're probably thinking, oh shit, self-watering sounds great, Kaylee. But now I'm in the midst of it. My plants are dying. What do I do? So you can make something self-watering at home pretty quickly if you can. So obviously this is a hack job and I'm kind of winging this as I'm speaking to you, but essentially self-watering is a plant in appropriate substrate that can handle it. So a well-draining soil, or maybe it's lecker, maybe it's pond, whatever it is. It's a plant in that suspended above some water, not submerged, but suspended in some water and a wick of some kind that can leach water up. Now, in most cases, that wick can be a really thick string or maybe a really thin rope, okay? You can make something that will help you at home. You're probably gonna need, obviously, your plant pots. You might need either a bigger catch pot or a tray, which I will get onto in a moment. And you can feed through some rope in the bottom of your pot, like loop it through the holes. Sorry, I'm just describing this verbally to you. There will be tutorials on the internet, I promise you. I will do one at some point if somebody wants me to do one. I'll have to find a way of making it look sexy. But you can make a self-watering system yourself. It's not too difficult. There are other methods as well. You don't have to use, um, you know, a wick in your plant pot and suspend it on rocks or, or something above some water. You don't have to do that. There are other things. There are... I don't know what they're called, but there is, there's various self-watering methods that you can buy on Amazon. And a lot of them are just uh, like, they're, they're still string based, essentially. They're like string that you can put on a stick and shove it into your plant pot. And that string is coming from a water reservoir, all of that sort of stuff. And if you're confused about how to go about that, if you don't want to buy self-watering, then you can get the same tips, essentially, for looking after plants when you're depressed as you can from content on YouTube that is looking after your plants when you go on holiday, because some of those solutions are gonna be the same. So my tip essentially, number one tip, is self-watering. And there are various methods that don't cost money. If you want to spend some money on, on plant pots, if that's something you wanna do, you can go for a brand called La Chusa. I'll link them down below on Amazon or I'll link the website, I'm not really sure yet. Or you can go for another really good brand that's called El Hole. I use a lot of those, they're great. Or to be honest, on Amazon, you can get some, some pots that are from different brands that also work. There is a variety of different things out there. Trust me, you can find some stuff. If you have to do it ad hoc with stuff you have around the house, you will be able to do it. So that is one tip. Similar to that would be a watering tray. Now this is really, really good if you don't even want to do that. What a great thing to do is, this doesn't really matter if it's lecker or soil, but you can get a tray that can hold, you need a tray really that can hold this much water at max. So what's that, like an inch to two inches? Get something that can hold that as wide as you want. Think of the trays I have in my shop. If you don't know, I actually can't show one to you, but I have trays about this long, this high, and I store all my plants in it. So what you need to do is get some kind of tray, take your plants out of the catch pots, or if they're just in a regular pot, cool, whatever, stick them into that tray and water them all in bulk. And don't do too much water in case they don't all soak it up. Just do it as you see fit. If you do this, all of your plants are in the one place and you now don't have to water five or six, 10, whatever pots. You can just essentially water one or two trays. And I use this every day in the shop. Obviously, I'm not using this for any reason other than just efficiency. But of course, that's what we need right now because we're not feeling our best. We need efficiency to look after our plants. So that's a really good method as well to look after things. And I do use that. I use both these methods. In fact, I use nearly all of these methods that I'm gonna show you. So the next one I have written down, it's, it's more of the same thing, admittedly, but even if you're not gonna go for a group watering uh, like tray or a self-watering tray or whatever, then just group your plants into one place and try and group them 
basically where you are the most. So if you're in your bedroom, maybe it's a good idea to try and keep them in the bedroom. If they cause too much distress to you, then maybe keep them in the living room or something else. But try and keep them in one spot. You don't have to have them everywhere, just isolate them. And then you can deal with your own exposure to them in that way anyway, because they're all in one place. So you don't have to walk around your entire house and see them everywhere. So that's really good as well for your health. So if you prefer to be around them, depending on how you feel, if you prefer to be around them and look after them, then you can do that. Um, if you don't want that and they're causing you too much distress, then you can group them together in a different room. And that's really handy as well. So you can manage your, your exposure and, and that kind of thing a little bit more easily. Of course, it also is really beneficial for watering. So if you, if you have a moment where you feel like you can water your plants, they're all there. There isn't one in the bathroom, you know, above the sink anymore, and one in the living room, and one in your sister's bedroom. It's fine. They're all in the one place. Just water them. So it's not foolproof, obviously, but it helps. It helps to have them in the one place, you know. Another tip I have, and this won't apply to everybody, but if you are able to get a friend, a family member, a significant other to help you in watering these plants, then that is absolutely great and you should do that. And I know not everyone feels comfortable about doing that. Not everyone feels that they can for a variety of reasons, but if you can do that, it's okay to ask that of somebody, that's okay. So if you feel comfortable doing that, you should do that and you should try and ask them. That's not, again, that's not a guaranteed tip, but if you want to do that, then you can. I understand that when you feel depressed, the last thing you probably wanna do is speak to anybody. I, I Trust me, I've been there, guys. Um, so it's not a tip for everybody, but if you're able to, then if you ask someone to help you, that could also be really fruitful. The last tip I have, and it might not be what you want to hear really, but um, considering, it's, it's so obvious, but just consider minimizing your collection if you feel frequently overwhelmed. Um, that really, that there's different options that you could do here. You could minimize your collection. You could buy things that are less expensive. So the, the perils that may or may not occur frequently, you know, when you can't look after these things and they die, it's not as much of a hit on your wallet, let alone your mental health. That's a good way of doing it. Or I know no one wants to hear this, right? I totally get that no one wants to hear this coming from a house plan channel, but you could always integrate a percentage of fake plants into your collection. I know, I'm recommending it. I really am. I don't care what people think. If that works for you, and your mental health and making you feel better so you can at least see some green and you still get stuff to take care of but it's not completely overwhelming if that's what provides you with balance go for it i think people get judged for having fake plants and i understand why it's it's a bit of a meme obviously in our community but you shouldn't be judged for it i'm not judging you for it and people that give a shit about you won't judge you for that either so that is another good way now i know not everyone's going to want to do that i totally get that that's it's just not for everybody, is it? But you might feel that that works for you. So that essentially is my tips. That's kind of a background on, on my stance on the whole thing, on plants and mental health a little bit and how to take care of them. Essentially, if you can automate it, that would be great. Another thing, by the way, grow lights on timers, stuff like that. If you can automate that, fantastic. If you know, if, if your plants are in a dark space and they don't get enough light and you've got the curtains drawn, try and get some grow lights on the timer. You don't have to do anything. You can get cheap timers that you manually punch in on the actual plug, the times, or you can get stuff that work with Alexa and you can program that in and you can do it on your phone. So if you're lying in bed on your phone, you can program that too and you can turn them on and off manually. So that's another one. But essentially, anyway, those are my tips on looking after houseplants if you feel down. And I want you to know it's completely normal how you feel. It really is. So that is kind of the end of that section. I don't think I have any more to say on that at the moment. That's kind of just my mini piece on it. But honestly, it's, it's hard. And don't buy into everything, once again, that you hear on social media about you know, plants being absolutely great for you because they're not always great for you. They, they can make you feel worse. It's not their fault. It's not your fault, but it can. And that's okay.
Okay, this next question might end up being a little bit shorter. I don't really know. I don't have many notes on this um, because I, I try not to buy into it. And that is obviously a pro tip. Try not to buy into it. Easy said than done. I get it. But the next topic I have for you guys is something you asked me about. And that is social media and the impact on your self-confidence. Now, a few of you asked me this. Uh, a lot of it was within context of plants. Some of it wasn't. I think some people asked it like kind of open-ended. So I kind of want to cover both. So I want to cover like, you know, having the, the amazing bougie plant collection. And I also want to very briefly cover, you know, looking a certain way and, and having certain things. Because I think that's just a, a rounded way of covering it. And anything I don't cover, by the way, that doesn't mean this topic is off limits for a future video. If, if we do more of these, if you enjoy this video, um, we can talk about some of these again. That's not a problem. Um, I, if this goes well and people respond well to this and they like this video, I'm more than happy to open up the floor to do this a lot more. And we can talk about so much, so much stuff. So don't feel like if I talk about this today and I say, you know, what I said on the last topic, which is like, oh, you know, I've said my bit, we can reopen it. It's really not a problem at all. So please just bear that in mind. What I say today isn't like the final say on anything because I, I grow and I change as well and I change my mind. So social media. I don't know if I'm a good person to talk about this or not. Um, but social media generally is, I think it's quite fair to say that it's the be all and end all for a lot of people right now. Some more than others. I, for example, am the tender age of 31. So I've been around before this kicked off. I was around for, you know, my space and various things before that. I think when Facebook came along, it, it wasn't really that much of a thing. I think I was like maybe 16, 17 when Facebook came about. It was never much of a thing. Instagram just was not a thing. It was not a thing. Now it's very different. And now a lot of people are growing up just being hit with that. And obviously the problem at the minute is COVID and it's made all this shit 10 times worse. It really has because that's all we have at the minute for a lot of us staying at home still. Um, I know it's different for different places in the world, but social media is right there. And whether you relied on it before, you may find that even though you've you've gone back to work and you've been able to get out of the house a little bit more with everything going on, it's still still kind of there because you're used to it now and things have changed. Like, I don't know if I would say I spent a lot of time on social media. Obviously, you may or may not know, I try and remove myself as much as possible. Um, the th I think the thing I mainly will sit on for a while is probably TikTok. But I actually don't think TikTok's that bad. I think as long as you fact check stuff, it's good. It can be funny, it can be motivating, it can be, it can be many things. So actually, my opinion on TikTok is that it's, it's okay, I think. From the limited information I know about TikTok, I'm, I'm okay with it, I spend a bit of time on it. But when I was asked this question, I feel like, I, no one said it, but I feel like the main bulk of the question involved like Instagram, maybe Facebook, maybe YouTube is affecting that as well. Maybe people like me are affecting that too. So maybe you could say YouTube, but that's where I felt like the question came from. So obviously we have two categories of this. We have owning certain plants and looking a certain way. <sighs> the thing is so many, this is the thing you have to realize guys. And this obviously goes for me too, but Anything you put on social media, whether it's your face or your plants, we'll limit it to those right now, but you can extrapolate, right? You can extrapolate it to your car or your dog or your career or whatever it is, right? Because this, this shit can transpire onto LinkedIn and all sorts of shit, it just manifests itself. But generally speaking, I have found from using social media that people post, it's a weird relationship between posting for themselves and posting for others. So they post things to make themselves feel better and to make others think that they are better. And it's that fucked up reinforcement when, when you get it, when you post something, for example, you know, say I'll use an example here. We've just bought a beautiful, I don't know, rare philodendron or something. And we're, we're putting it on Instagram and everyone's like, oh my God, it's great. You know, all of that. We post that to make ourselves feel better, but we're, we're not all the time, but a lot of us are seeking validation to feel better because we want to be accepted by our peers and we want to be seen. Part of it, I think, is seen as, as being successful, being seen as 
a desirable person to know because it, it, personality does come into this. It's not just about having the plants. I, I don't think in our case, I think personality comes into it as well. I've just having your shit together a lot of the time. And I think specifically with plants and the prices of them, that definitely comes into it because these these house plants now that get posted on the internet, for example, a lot of it's not even, um, look at my aesthetic, look at how good I am at looking after these plants. Because this hits on so many levels, guys. On one hand, you've got how easy these plants are to look after for me. Like, I'm just so good with them. And then on another hand, it's like, you know, I have such discipline in having all these plants. And another thing is like, I have the money to have all these plants. And it really like builds, it builds up on you in layers and it's not fucking healthy. I need to tell you, I understand the channel that I have. I understand the shop that I run. But there's a lot I purposely don't put on social media. And I know I've told you this guys before, I, I have some plants that I just won't post. I have no desire to. And it's important for me to show that it's not important as well. I do actually primarily do that for me. I don't post things because I, I don't feel like I need the validation. Um, but I also don't want to perpetuate this thing of, you know, you need this thing. I don't because you don't need these things. You don't. You don't need the expensive plants. You don't need to prove anything to anybody. I know it feels like you do, but I promise you, you don't. You don't need to prove anything to anybody. You're enough as you are. I know that's stereotypical. Honestly, I do. But you don't need to have the best plants. You don't need to have the most healthy plants. You don't need to have the best fucking car, the best handbag, the best clothes, the best makeup. You don't need it, guys. It's all shit. It's all stuff, right? I know... People think that houseplants fall under a different bracket because we take care of them, they're living things and everything else. I'm sorry, but the way that consumerism works, it's all just shit. It's all possessions. It's the same thing just masquerading as something else. I'm sorry, it is. It really is. Now, I'm not saying that people aren't getting enjoyment out of plants and taking care of them and cultivating a real collection that, that makes them feel excited and stuff. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying for a large amount of the internet, it's kind of not that, do you know what I mean? A lot of people are buying it to flex. People are buying things for clout, you know. That I've seen people show off in auctions. And that's another thing is that auctions are fucking toxic, honestly. I started doing auctions for a while on my shop because I didn't know actually how much to charge for certain plants. And I think that's because I was out of the game so long doing the documentary and doing up this place. I wasn't following anything because I didn't have time. So I started up my auctions last year because I didn't know how much things should cost anymore. I actually didn't know. And the auctions helped me gauge that a little bit. But generally, when you see auctions on Facebook and stuff, and I'm not saying this is the case, again, for everybody, but a lot of the time you see people just bidding on for like, for the clout, quite honestly. I'm not saying they won't pay for the plan or they don't want the plan or they're not excited about the plan, but guys, come on. How, how many times have you seen someone just throw out a stupid number on a plant and then be like, oh, I'm just warming up, you know, just dusting off the cobwebs. It's like, why? Why say that? <laughs> what are you here to prove? Okay, it's an expensive plant. If you want it, go get it. You know, well, what's, what's the point? What, what is the point of behaving like this? It goes down to anybody on social media that, that even photoshops their plants. Do you know what I mean? Even makes the plants look a different way to make them look better or flex this new red fucking variegated thing that they've got. And it's like, it doesn't fucking matter, guys. It's all shit. I'm sorry, it's all shit. I know that's an unpopular opinion, but it is. There is no difference to me personally in a rare plant or a designer handbag. And I do buy designer handbags occasionally when I can afford them. It's been a recent thing. I've not got into them. I'm kind of into them. But I see a lot of comparisons in doing that because yes, Plants, the only difference is, of course, they're alive, there's more risk, but it's still, for a lot of people, an investment and a return on investment. And I'm not, I'm not honestly sat here on this channel thinking, well, people just buy it because of the money and it's all about money. I'm genuinely not saying that. I don't believe it is that way for everybody. It was never about that for me. I, I've said this a million times. I just like shit that I haven't seen before. I find it very intoxicating, whether that's a movie, whether that's a plant, whether that's a rare version of anything someone's brought out, limited edition. I'm terrible for that. It's my personality type. But a lot of people are doing it for the gram, for the likes, for everything else. There are a lot of people out there that before COVID didn't have 
hardly any house plants, and now they've got everything rare. And if you don't have that rare thing, then you know, fuck you. You, you ain't shit. What a lot of shit, guys. And if you want to, the same thing is for appearance, by the way. I want to touch on that really quickly because I know I've made this very heavily about plants, but oh, I don't know where to start. What I didn't know, I know everyone knows about Facetune and stuff like that in terms of appearances and things like that and, and influences on Instagram looking beautiful and filtered and like this and all of that. I didn't know this. I knew about Facetune. I knew about all the other lumps and bumps that you can get rid of. But I didn't know that you can use effectively software very similar to Facetune on videos. Live videos, by the way. You can see these filters on TikTok. There's a lot of people talking about them and stuff like that. I, I found one a while ago on Instagram. Um, it was a silly one. It was like a plastic surgery one for your face, but it's just kind of like the, the tracking on the face and everything like that kind of blew me away that it, it works. It was just a bit crazy. You can use things like that now. None of it's fucking real. And honestly, I don't think you can trust it. And dare I say the same thing is with plants. Because if you can remove a spot on somebody's skin, you can remove a blemish on a plant, guys. It's not hard. It's really not hard. In fact, one day I might do a video showing you of how to do that. I've never done that. I think I've only ever photoshopped my face. And that was a long time ago. I think it was in the MySpace days. I was like heavily into my Photoshop. Um, now I genuinely believe it's important to not do that, by the way. And if you go onto my Instagram, actually either Instagram that I have, uh, I do have a personal one. I don't use it. Please don't add it. But I have a personal Instagram where it's like selfies. And then I have my Instagram that has my face on here and there. If you zoom in, you will see that it's not edited. Past a bit of brightness or whatever else, it's not edited. And I think it's really important. So I don't actually do that to my images because I understand how important that is. Um, and we will go on to more of appearing as I am a little bit later in what is probably going to be a part two at this point. But I need you to know it's all fucking fake. It's all bullshit. And I would love it if we could normalize putting normal plants on Instagram. I think I've said this in a video before, but I understand why we don't do it. Okay. I understand why we don't. And this is moving on a little bit into things that are less than perfect on Instagram. But I understand why we don't put stumps on Instagram and it's because it's not aesthetic. We know it. But does it mean we don't have a hundred stumps of plants that are dying sat there on the shelf at the bottom that y'all can't see? No. <laughs> I did a plant tour, guys. I did a plant tour, was it two weeks ago now? A week ago? Can't really remember. And I have stumps. I have stumps in this shop. Granted, they're kind of in specific places. There's some stumps over here that you can't see off camera. Um, they're like one leaf, uh, actually I have Gloriosum, one leaf Gloriosum that are, I'm waiting for them to pop leaves. I think I put them on an Instagram story a while ago when I was talking about Canadian shipping, I think. I have stumps. I have tons of Anthurian stumps in different places that are rehabbing. But even I didn't put them in the plant tour. And that is actually for other reasons and reasons I'm going to be completely transparent about because I've got nothing to hide. One is for an aesthetic reason. I wanted the plant tour to look absolutely great. And I believe that it did. I got the result that I wanted. But if I put stumps everywhere, it might not look as great. Now it makes for great viewing and good interest. And I will absolutely show you that content on like behind the scenes kind of stuff. But I didn't want to put it in the tour because it wasn't aesthetic. Do you know what I mean? I didn't want it to make me look bad. And I'm someone that has this, this channel with all these plant videos and all this, this great plant care in, in the shop or whatever. And I felt the same thing. You know, it's not limited to people that, I don't know, aren't influencers. Because I guarantee you influencers feel the fucking same. I do. I feel the same way about my appearance when I look at other influencers on Instagram and the, the amount of money I've spent on skincare just trying to look like these other influencers do with filters on, except I want my actual skin to look like that. It's stupid. But I've been a victim to it as well. Because it's, if you see something often enough, it becomes normalized. And it's normal to you and you don't even see that it's not real anymore. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it just happens. It's, it becomes your reality because it is your reality because it's everywhere and that's all you ever see. You don't see the shit that isn't filtered. You don't see the stumps that people aren't putting out. And every so often on my feed, I, I can't tell you who it is specifically, but I see people put pictures of less than perfect plants up and I fucking love it because I'm like, yes, 
Show me the shit that you've really got in your house. Because I know it ain't all of this pretty shit on shelves. I know it ain't. I know it ain't. You know, and I'm really happy to see it. And we should do it more. I would just love to see it. I really would. Now, I'm not saying that social media is, is toxic, but I, I guess it, it kind of fucking is, guys. For the most part, it is toxic. Now, you can just be in it for sharing the love of plants and everything else. I'm not condemning everyone that posts aesthetic pictures on their social media or I'm not condemning ev like you know everyone that wants to buy expensive plants because I'm one of them anyway I wouldn't do that you, you do what you want to fucking do you know I'm not condemning all those people but at the same time it's not necessarily what we should aspire to be you know do what you makes you happy because I tell you something whether it's your appearance or a plant if you spend fucking all of this time and energy into an Instagram photo or a post. That's so much energy into placing, not actually into yourself. I don't even think it is, but it's not. It's false. It's a false sense of um, confidence, I guess. You, you're doing it for the, for, the, for the hope that people will click that one button with a heart on it. Imagine how much time and energy that actually takes to invest all of your mental goodness into doing just that for that one fleeting moment of someone scrolling down a feed that might click on it. And I do understand that. Trust me, I understand that. Because numbers are everything on social media. There's something we don't talk about. Holy shit, I suffer from that, guys. Because I have a subscriber account. I have a following. I have fucking websites that post my stats on how popular I am and grade me on it. What the fuck, by the way? That's not cool. I don't look at them. But I understand from a numbers perspective because you, you, that's your feedback, right? That is it. Engagement, numbers, it's all, it's all shit. And honestly, you'd be so much better if you use social media less. And people ask me, obviously the, the original question was how to deal with jealousy of what other people have or um, just deal with the social media shit in general, whether it's people being nasty or whatever, which I will get onto later. But how to deal with it, honestly, you might not like my answer because it seems so simple, but just step away. Understand that these other people have stumps that they're hiding. I'm sorry, I don't give a shit who you are. I don't give a shit who you are. You've got them. You can try and pretend that you've never killed a houseplant or, you know, you just haven't fucked up once in a while. You can try, but you don't convince me. But the point is that's fine. That's the problem. It's fine to do that. Do you know how many plants I fuck up each week? It happens. Do you know what I mean? I might fi finish filming today and find something that I've fucking killed because I can't look after them all, obviously because I've bitten off more than I can chew. But my point is it's so fucking normal to fuck up. It's normal. You are taking plants in the context of plants. Sorry, I know this is ranty, but you are taking plants from an environment where they just fucking get everything and putting them into basically a laboratory, which is your house. And now you have to give them everything, but you don't know what they fucking need. We kind of know what they need and we have care tips and we have stuff like that. We don't know exactly what they need. Half the problems they might have, we might not even see. And now we feel ashamed of those things and we won't, we won't let anyone know that we have those problems. But imagine what would happen if instead of um, only posting the perfection shit and posting the problems, imagine how many more plants would exist that we could trade and do things with because people wouldn't be killing them because we'd all be fucking helping each other and building a real community of people that help people rather than a pissing contest, which is what I like to call it, to be honest. It is a bit of a pissing contest. Again, I'm not condemning all this, please. I know it's coming off really like, oh, fuck you. But if you want to do that, cool. But my point is don't um, don't be held to that standard. You can opt out of that. You really can opt out of that. And I've tried to opt out of as much as I can. I really have. I've done my best. Obviously, I'm in a position where I, I can't fully do that, obviously. Um, but th that's a little bit more unique to me or, you know, any other influencer that's it's in the influencer game, I guess you could say. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to operate in that bullshit environment. I just want to see social media, at least in our community, used for a good purpose. So a purpose of learning, that's a great way. And just the purpose of helping each other out. Plan swaps, yeah, cool, yeah. Um, care tips, yeah, awesome. Not this pissing contest of who has what. And I know that my answer is heavily tailored towards plants. Um, a lot of this can be applied to other things like, you know, 
Cars, clothes, handbags, appearance, hair, weight as well, huge one. But I'm mainly focusing it here on the plants because I, I, I think that's probably what you want to hear, right? Um, just know that I'm not buying into it. I refuse to buy into it. I'm not going to filter my face. I'm not going to filter my plants. I make sure that if I do a plant haul or I do a video where I have like top whatever plants, I make sure that I hold up a plant in all its glory. And sometimes I'll, if, you know, if, a, if a yellow leaf is hanging off it, I'll remove it. But if there's some transit damage on a leaf, I'll leave it on because it's fucking normal. And I just hope that, not as a result of this video because I'm not under any illusion there, but I just hope in the future that, at least in the plant community, we can kind of twist social media back into what a lot of collectors would probably call the glory days where it was, it was just simpler and people just loved plants. It didn't really matter how rare they were, or how expensive they were. They just, they just loved plants. It'd be nice to go back to that. Will it? I don't know, but I'm certainly not going to engage in the bullshit that is that. I'm going to do whatever I can to just do me, really. So if all of this stuff is affecting you, because you asked me again, sorry for tips on how to deal with it, it, it would just be remove yourself as much as you can. Um, you don't have to have a plant Instagram if you don't want to. You can have a plant Instagram if you want to document your plants and make it private. You don't have to, to do that. Do you know what I mean? There, there, there is options. You don't have to have an Instagram. You don't have to have, uh, you don't have to be a member of Facebook groups. It's entirely up to you. It's what you want to do. It's what you can handle. It's what makes you feel good about yourself. Because if it doesn't make you feel good, nip it in the bud. Great advice. If it doesn't make you feel good, just nip it in the bud. Okay, the next, I've got three topics left, but I've done a lot. So I don't know whether to put this topic in the next video or not. I think I will keep going and do topic three in this video, which is cyberbullying and haters and how to deal with it. It's not totally related to this section, but it's not really related to the other section. So it's kind of floating in the middle. So we'll do this on this video. So this is probably maybe going to be a bit longer than the next video. So, so I don't know how long this topic is going to be because I've spoken about this in fucking hell, too many videos, to be honest. Um, but another question I got asked, sorry, my lip gloss is sticking to my face. Another question that people ask me a lot, um, probably because I've gone through it, is cyberbullying or haters online, I think, and how to deal with them. Now, honestly, I think this, this goes for real life as well. You don't just have to apply this online. Um, I guess I could just tell you about the things I've learned. I don't really want to go into my experience because, I mean, I'll mention it where it's relevant, I suppose, but I don't want this video to be all about me. But unfortunately on this subject and another subject that I will mention in the next video, it's, I'm drawing so heavily from my experience, I, I can't really not talk about it in the context of me because this is how I learned these things. But anyway, cyberbullying, haters, how to deal with it. So. I, I've been bullied my, not my whole life, but I've, I've suffered many things and I will briefly touch upon it in the next topic, um, in the next video, but I've, I've gone through a lot of shit and in, in a lot of ways, I've always been quite used to being, um, hated on, to being bullied or just, just negativity from people. I'm, I'm very used to it, to be honest. I used to absorb it like a sponge. <laughs> but I don't anymore. I've, I've tried my hardest to learn how to not do that. And I think that is essentially what you're asking is to how not to, is how not to absorb it, essentially. I've had a lot of hate on this channel since I, not since I started actually, that would be wrong to say. I didn't get hate from the get-go on my channel. I think I didn't get any hate until around about maybe 35,000 subscribers. And I think the first instance of hate that I had on my channel, again, I'm not gonna totally go into this. I'm just kind of giving you uh, like a, an overview of what's happened so you know how long it's taken me to learn this stuff. Cause it really wasn't overnight. But the first time I had hate was when I first uh, put a philodendron spiritus sancti on camera. Uh, it was juvenile and I had a shit ton of people basically saying that it wasn't a spiritus and 
Enid from NSE Tropicals was saying, yo, that's not real, and, and I look like an asshole, basically. Um, it was really bad. That ruined an entire trip that I was on. It's not the first time that's happened, but I let that get to me a lot because it's my first instance of hate, and that's when it's the most potent, I find, when it's your first time. It's like that age-old thing they say the first time is the worst, right? So that, that sucked. I went from worried to straight up tears within about 60 seconds. It, it sucked. Uh, that, that genuinely upset me a lot because gaslighting is a huge part of this, I must say. It's a huge part of a lot of negative things that people can do to you. But in this instance, um, essentially, I'll not go into this. I don't want to. But um, I, I was kind of almost believing what people were saying because I thought, um, oh, God, did Enid really say that, for example? Long story short, Enid actually ID'd the plant before it was purchased. So Enid had seen photographs of the plant. So Enid already knew about the plant. But I honestly thought that it was possible that Enid had seen my video, looked at the plant that I now had that was not a photograph anymore, and thought that, you know, yeah, that, that, ain't, that ain't a spiritus. So it kind of got inside my head and I ended up believing what people were saying. I had to then go to Enid and it turns out Enid hadn't spoke to anybody, long story short, these people were making it up. So that was one thing that happened. There's been several things. I got blamed for the, the sudden increase in people buying plants and the price rise um, last year now. Of course, it was due to COVID, not to me. This is mainly because I wasn't even selling any plants last year. I wasn't really even putting them on camera last year. I was repotting a lot because I was doing up this place much to the secret of everybody else because nobody knew that when they were blaming me for it. I knew it and I knew that truth would come out in time. No one knew at the time. But I got a big hate wave for that. I got bullied online uh, at some given point on Facebook around about the same time, along with a few other influencers as well. Just nasty people, generally. Uh, after that, my documentary aired. I was about a month. And after that, when I was launching my shop, I put the stock online to view before the launch, like a week before, so people could really look at it and decide if they want something or not, or whatever, and, and have a long time to make a decision. And I did that because I didn't want people to make rush decisions in the heat of the moment, because I knew I would be putting all the stock on at one given time. I didn't want people to be overexcited after the documentary, for example, and, and make a purchase they didn't want to make. I'm not about that. Um, I think, you know, if you're going to spend money on something, you should, you should know, you should be okay with it. So I did it for that reason. And in that time, holy shit, a week of hell would be the best way to describe it. That was awful. Every man and his dog had an opinion on me. I had all kinds of threats from, not death threats. I don't think I got those. I got strong threats of violence or something happening to me. I may have got rape threats. I might've only had one or two though. So I can't remember, to be honest, it's a bit of a blur. A lot of different types of threats. A lot of people slamming my Facebook with bad reviews from my shop, despite having never bought from me. People writing all of my social media to boycott me, to cancel me, all of that sort of stuff. Um, obviously it goes without saying that I had much support during that time as well. It was hard to hear the support though, and this is a thing, over the hate, because the hate was so loud. It's so loud sometimes that it drowns out the support. And that is a thing. I, I know people think I'm negative and I only see the hate, but you need to understand when you're in that situation, the support, it does get drowned out by the hate, and that is a thing. But anyway, I had that, and I don't think... I've had any real shit since the price shaming thing. I've had a lot of people on social media try to take me down for clout purposes because every time I check when someone's starting some shit, they're, they're really after an increase in followers. It's, it's a pattern I've come to understand it, in nearly every case, by the way, nine times out of 10. So I just ignore them and I don't engage. And I just hope that I don't get an angry mass of people asking me to address things because that's part of it for me anyway learning what to ignore and what not to ignore, learning what to address and what's not to address. But I realize that I'm in an entirely different situation. I'm in a, in a really potent version of that situation. Before I get into what I've learned, I wanna preface this by saying something. I don't condone hate or harassment of any kind, but I will make a distinction here. You know, like if I say like, oh, you know, they hate you because they ain't you, I'm only talking about a certain group of people here, okay? And I want to make this really well known. For example, if you are a racist, if you are homophobic, 
if you are, I don't know, misogynistic, if you're just generally projecting that level of hate, that is a hate crime and I am not including you in this little bubble. You don't get to be in that bubble. You don't get my tips. You don't get my protection. You don't get any of that. You are not included. I've had an instance where somebody, and I had to delete it, I think. I had an instance where it might have been the Facebook post a while ago when I said, you know, I'm taking a break and stuff, like late last year. I think it's still on my Instagram. And I think somebody said like, oh, you know, um, oh, I know how you feel recently. A lot of people came at me online and it was terrible. And I came to find out via, I think quite a few people messaging me actually in social media, that the person that was saying this was a person that had recently been outed for essentially racism and you know they were they were trying to relate to me and they're like oh no it's hate it's terrible people shouldn't be like that i'm just gonna say something that maybe not a lot of influencers might say this shit don't apply to you if you're racist i'm sorry you're on your own i don't give a fuck i do not give a fuck i do not give a fuck that we don't take that here so any of my tips don't apply to you they don't apply to you if you're transphobic Anything like that, racism, against women, against anything that is fucking good in this world, these don't apply to you. Sorry, I had to say it before I moved on. I thought it'd be really important to make that distinction. And I actually had a note on my bit of paper here, making sure that I mentioned that because we, no, we don't protect those kind of people. I don't offer you advice. I don't give you my protection. If you tag me in something um, or you, you send me a nasty message or a nasty comment, you can't send me messages anymore on my Instagram I will probably out you and I won't blow you out because I think if you're going to be racist, transphobic, homophobic, anything, you're really, you're working so hard for my attention, I'll give it to you and you won't like it. And I don't give a shit what people say at me for that. That's, I'm not protecting those people. We will not protect people like that. So I want to make that important distinction. People like that, I'm not saying they deserve terrible, terrible things. I'm not even going that far. I'm just saying this shit don't apply to you. Kindly leave. Click off. So my tips for people that are actually good people, these are for you. So I've found a few things that trend in terms of haters. Um, it has taken me a long time to learn, by the way, a real long time to learn, because I, I've said this before in a video, people can say this to you until you're blue in the face, but you just have to make sense of it on your own. And I suspect that I will say a lot of things today in this video that people have said a million times, and I'm gonna sit there going, it's cliche, but it's true. And you'll hear it possibly and be like, yeah, everyone fucking says that. One day, I promise you, it will click for you. Um, and that, that's the thing that's been a struggle for me because a lot of people have said like, why don't you get it? We've told you, just stop paying attention to these people. It's so difficult though. It's so difficult. Because when you make videos like this, you're essentially in a glass box. It's like two-way glass. I always think of it like that or like being in a goldfish bowl. You know what's around you, but you don't know anything outside of that. And it's hard to gauge everything coming in when everything is so convex and it looks bigger than it is, right? It's a great analogy, but it's true. And it goes for anyone doing this kind of thing, really. Um, or really anything on social media because you don't know the full span of things. Do you know what I mean? If you get a hundred nasty people coming at you, does that mean there's actually 10,000 or does it mean there's actually just a hundred? You don't know. Do you know what I mean? It's hard to gauge. It's a really horrible thing to try and work out for yourself. It's really, really shit. And I do sympathize, and that is why it took me a long time. But generally, I've found a few trends. So a lot of the time, um, if someone is giving you hate, bullying, any anything in that umbrella, they're normally doing it, not always, but they can be doing it because you generally don't fit into their narrative of maybe their belief system, but just generally their perceived reality or their opinions on something. Like, um, to give a quick example, I guess... If someone hates on you for owning a certain plant or not owning a certain plant, they're giving you shit because you don't fit into their ideals of what plants you should own. And that, my friend, is not on you. That's on them. And if they really want to define their, their ideals by shit that you should own, and we've covered this, you know, it's all shit, it's all possessions, then that's on them. That's not on you. You don't have to care about that. And again, I know it's easier said than done. Trust me, I lived it. I lived it for a year. Shit ain't easy. I understand that. But generally, when people go at you, that is one of the reasons why they go at you. It's because you do not fit into their little box of what they want. And this could be extrapolated to a lot of things. But in terms of, AJ, the example of, 
owning a plant or not owning a plant, that's a great way. Because I, I hear about people all the time getting apparently hated on for not wanting to have a certain plant. And it's like, well, why the fuck do you care? Like, <laughs> I don't understand that personally. I, I don't even understand the mindset of the person doing that. And that's a struggle for me personally because um, this is actually how I learn. I can't learn things unless I'm given a proper context to break down and analyze myself. So, you know, I, I struggle to understand people when they're like, well, fuck you, you don't own this. I, I struggle, I can't understand in their mind why that's important and how that matters at all. Um, and that can sometimes stop you from being able to deal with this kind of shit and make sense of it. It's really hard. It clouds your judgment a lot because half of it, you're just trying to understand what's going on. You know what I mean? And that's what makes it worse sometimes. Now this and a lot of things I'm going to say boils down to one simple fact about haters or, you know, people that do these things. And that is that they have such an underdeveloped understanding of A, other people and B, themselves. This is so important. This has taken me so long to learn, but it comes from an underdeveloped understanding, right? That's essentially what so much of this boils down to. Because another reason that people will hate on you is because you make them question their ideals of themselves and their representation of themselves, or in some cases, the shit that they have and the shit that they don't have. You make them question that because they look at you possibly thriving. It really depends on your situation, but let's just assume you're a badass bitch because I'm sure you are. They look at you thriving in whatever it is you're fucking doing and they look in on themselves subconsciously and they see that they aren't that thing that they perceive to be so important to them. But the problem is, rather than working on themselves and dealing with that, what you end up getting from that is their projection of that back out on you because they don't, they're don't they not ready to deal with it themselves. They don't have a developed understanding of how they're feeling when you are putting them in this position, not knowingly, you didn't do anything wrong. Do you know what I mean? This is on them. Again, this is the number one thing about haters. It is on them. This shit is on them. But you question, you make them question something about themselves, whether that's their own career, whether that's their own choices, whether it's sometimes their own personality. And then instead of them working on it, them sitting there going, oh man, why, why aren't I like that? Or, or whatever it is, whatever it is. They project hate outwards because they, they can't, they don't have the, the tools to deal with it and break it down and contextualize it. They don't have it for whatever reason, for whatever reason. That doesn't make them bad people in itself, by the way. What makes them bad people is the projecting it outwards and not really caring whether that hurts somebody else. That is the difference because we will all feel like that given the right thing that is put in front of us, right? If I go and I don't know, I've gone for a walk at the beach and I see someone on an amazing yacht, some millionaire or something, that's probably going to make me look at myself. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But that'll make me look at myself and I'm like, damn, I, 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 want, I want to work harder. But that's the difference between me and a hater. I'll see something like that. I know I'm using that. That's a shitty example, granted. But I'll look at it and think, fuck, you know, I want to work harder. I want my shot. Why not? You know, I want my shot. A hater won't, won't do that. They can't. They can't take what it is that they see in that person or that situation and make sense of it. They can't. It just frazzles them. They can't. And they have to project it outwards. They have to get rid of it. They don't like it. It makes them feel uncomfortable. You or whatever it is, is making them feel uncomfortable. And that shit is not on you. Very important. Again, unless you're being fucking racist or anything like that, that shit is not on you. It's on them. And unfortunately, they do not have the tools to deal with it. So it comes back out. It's like a sponge in, out. No, not having that. There is also another reason people hate and it, it's not a genuine, it's not genuine hate necessarily, but I find that sometimes people hate to please others or to fit into the crowd. Again, it's a very popular one. Um, you know, it goes down to kids in the playground. You know, there's, there's always one bully and then a group of bullies with them. Statistically, not all of those people are also... Um, of the same mindset as the bully, for example. So you have five people in a playground bullying one person. doesn't really matter what it's for. 
you have you have the main bully here. Statistically speaking, not all of these other people are going to be of the exact same mindset as this person. Half the time, and I've been in this situation when I was a kid, trust me, half the time there'll be people that go along with it because they can see what this person is and they want to avoid it. So they will go along with the bully. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, this happens a lot still in social media. Shit ain't changed. It's human behavior. We want to fit in. We don't want to be singled out. And there is a, a great need to do that. I'm not saying this happens all the time, but sometimes people will give you hate in order to protect themselves from hate. I know it seems ridiculous, but they do. They do it to fit in with the crowd. You know, they'll go with the popular opinion. It's like following fashion in a sense, I guess, except now it's not, it's hate. Terrible analogies, I know. Please appreciate I'm doing this completely on the fly, as you can probably tell. But that is another reason why people might hate. They might not genuinely hate, but they might be going along with it. But that said, these people still need to go in the bin because you don't need those people either. They've proven themselves as well as that. So if you get someone that comes to you in a situation where... I know you were made fun of in a restaurant for what you wore. You, you know, when you went to a club and you got made fun of for what you wore. You turned up at school and you did something different with your hair or something and people made fun of you or you wore something different. And then you've got that one friend that comes up to you, friend that comes up to you afterwards and says, you know, I'm sorry I was going along with it. I didn't know what to do. Um, that's on you whether you want to give that person another chance. Um, I'm a believer in you, you, it depends on what they've done, but you give everyone maybe a second chance. It really is up to you guys. There's no rules on this. But if someone pers persists to do that, you, you don't need them, trust me. You do not need them at all. It's, it's not something you need. So judge every situation and do what you think is right. But not everyone is, is truly hating on you. I, I guess what I mean by that is it, that's not supposed to make you feel super good about it, but I guess just know that what you see might not necessarily be what you get. Those people still need to go in the bin. I'm not saying they don't, but the true hate that you're getting might just be from a more central point than, you know, it's literally everybody. Because a lot of people stay silent in certain situations. And silence is, is basically, it's the same thing as racism, right? You, you're essentially, nowadays, you, you're being complicit in a sense if you don't actively show that you don't put up with that shit. It should be applied to other things as well, I think. It should be applied to bullying and stuff like that. So that is another thing as well. Another thing, I'm, and this is totally related, but I tell you now, haters have to be so fucking loud. They have to be the loudest person in the room, in the comment section, in the Instagram stories. They are the loudest. And you can expect tirades of rants, or at least in my experience. They're doing this. They're trying to be so loud because for whatever reason, you've made them feel so quiet and so small. And that is why they do it. They just have to reassert themselves. They have to reassert themselves because they don't like it. Again, they cannot understand the context of things and how certain things in the universe make us feel. They can't make sense of it. So they try to get rid of it and project it back because they acknowledge that you've done something in their brains, right? To make them feel a certain way. They know that much, but they just can't, they can't make sense of it. So just fucking, it just comes straight back out. So that happens a lot as well. They just have to be so loud because you make them feel so quiet. And it happens in my comment sections. It occasionally happens to me on Instagram. If you wonder why I ignore it, that's why, because I'm not gonna give them what they want. They want followers, in my case anyway, a lot of the time, people will go at me for shit I didn't even do in to try and gain a following. Or, I mean, I get this a lot as well. I get people starting rumors about me. I heard a great one the other day. It was wild. Um, but people start rumors about me to discredit my character. That's another one. They will do whatever they can to discredit you and bring you down. Because if they see other people support you, that doesn't, that doesn't sit well with them a lot of the time. They will try and bring you down in any way they can. It's not sexy. Another thing as well, I'll get onto this, is the hate and the criticism thing. It's like, oh, you know, it's not hate, it's criticism. And somebody said to me in my comment section, this was great. Again, this, this is not going to apply to everybody in the universe, but somebody said, um, you know, criticism, you get criticism when you ask for it. And if you didn't ask for it, you don't have to accept it. And you get criticism from people you give a shit about. You have no right to accept the criticism of a stranger on your Facebook post, in your Instagram comments, on your YouTube comments. You have absolutely zero right to listen to them. And... I get this every week, guys. I get this every fucking week. I know some of you have seen it and joined in on it on occasions because I like to try and have fun with it now, I guess. Um, 
a thing for me is people think I'm um, kind of perpetuating it sometimes. If I like post something on Instagram, like someone's kind of going off about something. I'm not. I'm calling out bullshit and I will get to that in a minute. But people offer criticism and I tell you something because I've tested people on this. The second you basically just make out you're not going to accept it or you're not bothered, it turns into hate straight away. And then you are you're not accepting criticism and you're not this, you're not that. And then if you tell them to basically do one, which is what you would do in real life, they say that, in my case anyway, of course, they'll say that you're unprofessional, that you're rude. That's gaslighty as fuck and we ain't, we ain't dealing with that. If you see that, do not engage with that. That's ridiculous. You can't offer something to someone that no one asked for and then when no one listens to you or no one seems to care, they're now the asshole. You, that's again, that's entitlement, that's a problem with the person itself because they don't understand the context of what they're saying and what is happening. They don't understand, they don't have the tools for whatever reason to understand and deal with it. It's an underdeveloped understanding of people and what you can and can't do. And that's honestly, in essence, that's what a lot of hate is. It really is. It's entitlement. It is... Um, a, not being able to understand how, like, full context of a situation. It's feeling bad about yourself and things you know you want to change and people come along and they're not trying to push your buttons, but, you know, someone is successful or whatever and it does push your buttons. A lot of it is that. It's, trust me, though, it's all about them. It's not about you. I'm not just saying this to make you feel better. It has taken me so long to learn that. I, I know this. But I'll tell you one thing, and this is a really good thing to, to know to people that are... Um, I'm really doing anything. This, this could apply to anything, but if you are, say you're starting a business or you're starting a YouTube channel or shit like that or anything really, and you, you're becoming more successful or whatever have you, and you always get people just sniggering and talking behind your back. Let me tell you something. I've started to enjoy people talking behind my back. And do you know why? Because if all these bitches are talking behind my back, it confirms to me that I'm the bitch in front. And I would rather have them talking behind my back and be the bitch in front. Trust me. I, you've got to learn to, to harness that concept. And it will take a little while to get there. At least it did for me anyway. But you've got to learn to harness that. Because honestly, once you do, you get so used to it and you thrive on it so much that these people talking behind your back, they, you don't even hear them anymore because you're so far in front. Because you've learned to harness it and not give a shit. And it takes practice. For me, it, it just took a long time. I think, I feel like a lot was thrown at me very quickly, especially last year. I, did, I didn't get a minute to breathe. So you could argue if things had gone a bit slower, then maybe I would have learned this quicker. But in essence, that's kind of what it's about. You know, if people are talking about you behind your back, you're the one in front. Now I'm going to talk about the, the one concept that I actually definitely reject around the subject of people just being dicks to you. This is so important and I do not understand. It's another thing I don't understand why people don't talk about. This is so important and if anybody's going to be the one to talk about it, it's going to be me and it's going to be now. So the one thing that I categorically reject and do not accept and it is the reason why Sometimes I do clap back. Some people like it. Some people think I'm all about the drama. You get me totally wrong. I fucking promise you here. But the one thing I absolutely reject is when people say, be the bigger person. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't apply ever. What I am saying is the amount of time that people say it and they're only saying it to the person that's had the wrong doing, you know, that, that, that had the shit happen to them. It's never said to the person doing the shit. Have you noticed that? Because I have. You know, something bad happens to you. You know, somebody, I mean, I'm struggling to think of examples here because that's probably COVID. I can't think of a real world scenario anymore that isn't on the internet because I haven't been anywhere. You know, somebody does something, it hurts you a lot. You know, someone else is aware of it, your friend or you, your family or whoever, it doesn't really matter. They mean well when they say it, by the way, but they say, be the bigger person. Can someone please explain to me, please explain to me why nobody is saying that to the person that's done the thing wrong? What? I, I don't understand that. And I'll tell you why. I absolutely think you should not do that. 
And it's really unpopular advice, and I, I get that, but this is where my attitude comes from. And I think I'm going to keep it because it's worked for me thus far. I will not accept somebody saying to me, be the bigger person, for this reason. If I accept that, it means in that situation, I've accepted their behavior. That's literally what it translates to for me personally. It means I accept that behavior. I now have to walk around with that and carry that. And I know you can say, well, you know, just let it go. It's not easy. With people, it doesn't necessarily work like that, does it? Does it, really? I know it's like, it's one of those things. It's like be the bigger person. It's like, just let it go. It's like, yeah, what if I fucking can't? Do you know what I mean? To let things go takes time. It doesn't necessarily happen overnight. And when you accept the advice of be the bigger person, you are accepting that behavior and you are possibly choosing to continue to walk around with that experience and, and, and holding on to it and absorbing it like a sponge. And this is so damaging. It's such a damaging concept to me personally. Now, obviously my background is a little bit different to maybe a lot of people's, but for me that's damaging and I won't do it. But when you allow the other person off scot-free, for example, without calling them out, without saying anything, whatever, right? When you accept the whole be the bigger person thing, you are telling the other person that you accept that behavior and that they can do whatever they want, they can say whatever they want, and you are going to take it because you're just going to be the bigger person. Do you think that makes the other person change anything they're doing? No. And honestly, it really depends on the situation as to whether that's an okay thing or not. If it's someone in passing, like you met them in a club or something, and it's a bit of a kerfuffle, yeah, you can probably walk away with that. Obviously, the context is everything here. Do you know what I mean? If it's a situation where you're not going to see the person again, it's fine. But if it's somebody in your life, like a partner or a friend or anything, that's really damaging to then harness the concept of be the bigger person. It's not. It's not. You're accepting the other person's behavior. Again, it's contextual. It's a sliding scale. But personally, I don't think that's okay because you take the advice of be the bigger person, right? Again, it depends what the person's done, obviously. But then now apply it to a relationship with your partner. And your partner keeps doing things that upset you, distress you, make you feel stressed, make you feel sad. And someone just says, ah, they don't mean it. Just be the bigger person. It's fine. Really? Because then that gets you, and I've been in this situation, it gets you into a point where you start to learn to accept the behaviors and it's not okay. So with that said, without going into a big thing, because honestly, I could go on about it all day. The advice of be the bigger person is not a great one for me personally. And I don't sit here pretending that I'm like the guru of everything. I'm not. It's just my stance. And I'm aware that my stance is not the most popular stance, but that's to me, that's the reason even more why I should talk about it because it's not the popular stance and I think people need to hear another perspective. So that is my thing. That is haters. That is the whole be the bigger person thing and why I probably wouldn't do it. I'm not saying go and cause a stink. I'm just saying it again, depends on the situation. Call out the person, block them, remove them from your bubble, remove them from your life, remove them from whatever you've got to do, depending on the severity, depending on the context. But don't just put up with it. I, I implore you to not put up with it because I tell you what, you will develop such a stronger skin and such a stronger sense of self if you start doing that. You can do that to whatever level that you want. It's, it's up to you. Start small. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's up to you. But that would be something that I would just mull over and, and see if maybe that's something that might benefit you. It benefited me a lot, and a lot of people have noticed some changes in me, and I don't think they like all of them, but they're here to stay because I'm stronger. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, that is my stance. That is the topic of haters, how to deal with it, and a little bit of a, not a tip, but a, a little bit of a, an FYI on be the bigger person, I guess. Okay, I know it's noisy. That's because I'm now editing and my heaters have just come on in the unit. But basically, I forgot to split the video into two parts when I was physically speaking in this video. So basically, I forgot to say goodbye. So thank you very much for watching part one of this mental health chat. Please leave any comments you wish to down below. Any chats you want to have, feel free. And I will see you in the next video, probably at the same time next week. So really sorry for this really disjointed goodbye. I completely forgot. I just kept reading all the topics. But anyway, 
Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for your time. I can already see in editing that this was a long one. So thank you very much. And I will see you next time in the next video. Bye guys.